Hail all, brave city Bromjanar, forever these walls shall stand. May enemies see her majesty, may all quake to behold her. Ancient Nordic ruins dot the frozen tundras of Skyrim in abundance, like stars in the night sky. If you venture from the comfort of the cities, it won't take you long to encounter one of these majestic structures. These marvels of masonry defy the harsh northern winds, and not even several millennia of ice could erode their robust exteriors. But one Nordic ruin in particular dwarfs all the others, not only due to its epic scale, but also due to its history. Most notably, this ruin is known as Labyrinthian, but it has gone by other names, names made obscure by the passing of time. Once upon a time, this magnificently vast ruin was a glorious metropolis, the capital city in a time when dragons ruled the north. The great stone heart of the dragon cult, created in the image of Akatosh himself, the dragons of the Morethic era were cruel tyrants, powerful and unyielding to their human subjects. Led by Alduin the World Eater, the draconic god-kings of Skyrim and their dragon priests convened in Labyrinthian to discuss matters of ruling, and with an entire race of men enslaved at your disposal, it comes as no surprise that the city was built to resemble the eminence of the dragon cult. Ever since those tumultuous times, Labyrinthian has been a place of convergence. Influential people and powerful relics alike found their way to the ancient city, as if by some divine prophecy. And the only thing more expansive than the ruin itself is its history. A history we're going to explore in this video. Hey guys, it's Drew here and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. Seven years since the release of The Elder Scrolls V, one thing that keeps me coming back to this game is the sheer amount of lore and world building weaved into every location. The first time I explored this Nordic ruin, it was just another Nordic ruin. But after learning the history of the place, I could re-enter with a new appreciation, understanding the amount of suffering that went into constructing it, as well as the reason for that peculiar maze which serves as its namesake. So before I start rambling, how about I just get into it? This place was not always called Labyrinthian. In fact, the citadel existed long before the labyrinth was built. When the dragon god kings were at the height of their power, the city was named Bromjanar, and it was a prosperous place, built as a temple in honour of the mighty dragons. Even now, thousands of years later, you can get a sense of the place's immense size, from the dungeons of Loss of Olkig, to the chasms and antechambers behind the ceremonial door, which descend deep into the earth. In its prime, Bronjanar would have been as grand as the dragons it was built in reverence of. Back in the Morefic era, the dragons chose a small group of worthy mortals to rule the Nords in their behest, and Bromjanar was their seat of power. These rulers were called Dragon Priests, and their service to the Dragon Overlords was rewarded with extraordinary magical powers, and the potential to become undead liches, evading their own mortality. No wonder these oppressive priests were so loyal. As well as serving as the hub for politics, Bromjanar was also the sacred home of the Dragon Priest Mask, Konarik, the greatest of the Nine Masks. It is believed by many scholars and speculators that the mask still remains within the sanctuary at Bromjanar, completely intact despite the eroded state of the city around it. The hierarchy of men ruled by dragon priests ruled by dragons was known as the Dragon Cult, and as I've made pretty clear thus far, it was not a peaceful arrangement for the Nords. The early Atmorans did worship the dragons in the same way they worshipped all of the totem animals in their pantheon. To them, the dragons corresponded to the dragon totem named Alduin. Imperial scholars speculate that Alduin is the name by which the ancient Nords knew Akatosh, the dragon god of time and later patron deity of the Empire. The leader of the cult was fittingly named Alduin, and even claims in a conversation with the last dragonborn to be the firstborn of Akatosh. Therefore, the dragons were not always perceived as tyrants to the Atmoran settlers in Skyrim, for they were the subjects of the utmost veneration. But as time passed, they considered themselves more and more superior to humans, and they grew much more malevolent in their leadership. From Bromjanar, they ruled with an iron fist. Eventually, later in the Morethic era, the men rebelled, and the Dragon War was waged. At first, men died by the thousands. The ancient texts reveal that a few dragons, Alduin's chief lieutenant and younger sibling Parfanax being a well-known example, took the side of men, 
Why exactly they did this is not known, but in the case of Parfanax, he defected to the side of men due to Kynes' wishes according to Nordic legend, as well as due to Alduin's false claim to godhood and his desire to rule the mortal world. The priests of the Eight Divines claim it was Akatosh himself that intervened. From these dragons, men learned magics to use against dragons. Parfanax taught the Nords to use the Fum, the dragon tongue. The tide began to turn, and dragons began to die too. The war was long and bloody. The dragon priests were overthrown, and dragons were slaughtered in large numbers. The surviving dragons scattered, choosing to live in remote places away from men. The dragon cult itself adapted and survived. They built the dragon mounds, entombing the remains of dragons that fell in the war. They believed that one day the dragons would rise again and reward the faithful. In the first era, remnants of the dragon cult still existed, but for the most part, the Nords were disenchanted with the dragons and rejected the Eight Divines for some time as a result. But by convincing the Nords that Alduin had acted against Akatosh's wishes, the missionaries serving the Eight managed to bring them around. The last known holdouts loyal to the dragon cult were besieged in Forlhost by High King Harald. They were driven to commit mass suicide within the walls of the monastery in the 140th year of the First Era, thus ridding Skyrim of dragon cult sympathizers altogether. With the defeat of the dragon cult during the Dragon War, the city of Bromjanar crumbled and was left abandoned. The shrines and temples fell into ruin, and the once glorious citadel faded into obscurity. Sometime in the First Era, a renowned wizard named Archmage Shalador set his sights on Bromjanar. Just as the city had once hosted the powerful draconic god-kings of Skyrim, the city attracted another powerful being. Shalador was acclaimed in many legends. It is said that he built the city of Winterhold with no more than one whispered spell. Rumour has it that he stole the secret of life from Akatosh, and the stories even say that he defeated the legions of the Rork and Dwemer clan single-handedly at the Battle of Rork and Shalador. While all of these legends are impressive, one in particular stands out. This is the so-called Secret of Life, which is known as Glamoril in the language of the Elves, and the legends tell that he found this secret within the ancient city of Bromjanar. Little is known of this Secret of Life, as popular belief holds that the purpose of his journey to Bromjanar was actually to construct an intricate labyrinth. Unlike Glamoril, tangible evidence of this maze exists to the modern day, and it became the namesake for the city going forward. The name Bromjanar was officially relegated to the histories, and the place became known as Labyrinthian after Shalador's construction. The purpose of the maze was to test potential new archmages. If they survived navigating the ruins and making it through the labyrinth, they passed. The labyrinth is actually divided into two sections, both of which must be navigated to complete Shalador's test. Several gates bar the path, and can only be opened by casting a spell from the specific school of magic. How to navigate the labyrinth is not common knowledge, as all the archmages who passed were very secretive. Eventually, Labyrinthian ceased to be used, and became regarded as a symbol of a more brutal age by modern institutions for magical studies. The ruins lay empty again, overrun with wild animals and avoided by travellers. The long history and legacy of this place, however, seems as likely to be erased from our minds as the ruins themselves are likely to sink into the sea. Shalador's maze serves as proof of his philosophies later in life. He stood at the forefront of a movement to enact higher standards among mages, and to discourage spell use among the common people. After retiring from magic, he became a prolific writer, and scholars have searched for his writings for thousands of years since. There's some speculation that this secret of life he supposedly possessed, whatever it was, may have been the catalyst for the practically unbelievable number of writings he produced on a vast array of topics. After Shalador's tests were abandoned and the city was reclaimed by the wild, Labyrinthian laid dormant for some time. It played a minor role in the histories during this hiatus. For example, Jarl Gjarland of Whiterun used the location as a source of lumber and stone for his hold, and sometime later, two brothers, Canaan the Elder and Magrus the Dim, ventured into the maze in search of the Secret of Life, despite being warned against it. The brothers were ensnared by the riddles contained within the labyrinth, and their ghosts were made to guard the ruins. Magrus guarded the Diamond Key, and Canaan guarded the Sapphire Key. Both keys were needed to get to the center of the maze. 
But after two errors in relative obscurity, Labyrinthian returned to pertinence thanks to the legendary sorcerer, Jaeger Farn. During the Imperial Simulacrum, which took place late in the 4th century of the Third Era, he utilized the vast expanses of Labyrinthian to hide a fragment of the Staff of Chaos. The Eternal Champion tracked down and recovered the piece, and even freed the two brothers Kanan and Magrus's spirits. After his death, the Eternal Champion became a folk hero to Imperial Loyalists, and the more devoted of his followers make pilgrimages north to Labyrinthian in his honor, retracing the hero's steps. Even after all of this, the ancient ruins of Labyrinthian were not forgotten, and power continued to be drawn to the place like some kind of lodestone. A few decades later, in the 427th year of the Third Era, the Staff of Magnus, a powerful artifact belonging to the God of Magic himself, came into the possession of the undead dragon priest Morakai, who dwelt deep within the ruins of Labyrinthian. Savos Aren, the current Archmage of the College of Winterhold, took a group of students down into the depths of the ruin in an attempt to retrieve the staff. The plan went horribly awry, and the mages were no match for the denizens of old Bromjanar. Aaron was the only one to make it out alive, and he was even forced to sacrifice two of his peers to contain Morakai within the pits of the city. The ruins were sealed behind him, and Morakai was kept imprisoned until the 201st year of the Fourth Era. This is where we reach the modern day, and the ruins stand sturdy as ever, thousands of years after its foundation. The last dragonborn, while in service to the college, was sent to Labyrinthian to search for the Staff of Magnus, and open the seal placed by Aaron years previous. The dragonborn defeated Morakai, and claimed both his mask and the Staff of Magnus, which was later used to stabilize the Eye of Magnus. In their adventures, the last dragonborn unearthed one other secret in the Nordic ruins. On the surface of the city, exposed to the elements, the Bromjanar Sanctuary can be seen. At the center of it, a dilapidated altar sits, worn away by time. An unknown scholar had discovered the secret to activating the altar. All eight of the lesser dragon priest masks were required, as well as the ceremonial wooden mask, which lay in the hands of the dead scholar. Donning the mask would send the wearer back in time, to a time before the city was left to rot. In this time and place, the mask Konarik could be retrieved and returned to the present. You can see now why Labyrinthian is so much more than just another Nordic ruin. Across the ages, powerful entities and potent sorceries have been drawn to this ancient citadel. From the dragons of the Morefic Era, who enslaved the masses in their hubris, to the legendary mages in search of Glamoril, this city is steeped in history. Could it be that Akatosh's secret of life truly is stored here? Or is that just another tall tale told by romantic bards and pensive scholars? Either way, that's all there is to know about the ancient city of Labyrinthian. I hope you enjoyed the video, thanks so much for watching, I've been Drew, and I'll see you next time.